Uh, welcome uh, live here from Amsterdam for the sixth version of the webinar series Together or Alone and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm uh, Paul Tang, member of uh, the European Parliament and I initiated this, uh, this webinar series because this is an, a crazy time. Uh, the economic consequences are huge and people have a lot of questions on what the economic consequences will be and what is the right policy. And we invite economists and other experts to join us and to um, to explain to people what is going on to have their have their views. This time we have a, a very special uh, uh, special edition. It's in English to start with. Um, um, later we will be joined by Jakob von Weizsäcker. He is um, a former member of European Parliament. Uh, has been a very nice colleague, brilliant, I must say. He always knows uh, five things I don't. Um, and he will be joining us later. He's now moved from the European Parliament to the Ministry uh, of Finance in Berlin, where he's chief economist and uh, the uh, one of the closest advisors of Olaf Scholz, the Minister of Finance. And he has his fingerprints all over the, the German-French proposal. Um, I was sad to see Jakob leave, but I was very happy to see Luis Garigano uh, arrive. He's also an eminent uh, uh, economist with an academic track record, worked as a uh, professor at London School of Economics and uh, IE Business School in Madrid. Um, and he now has become a member of the European Parliament since, since last year and is one of already or one of the, the leading members of parliament on, uh, on economic affairs and he represents uh, the Renew Europe group uh, in the European Parliament. Um, for, all, uh, for all the uh, attendees, uh, for all the viewers, uh, you can ask us questions through the chat function and we uh, ask you if you want to come in live on the show to download the GoToWebinar app so that you can uh, to ask your question uh, in person. And before we start, uh, we have a short poll to, uh, to ask you a question. What is your view as uh, attendee of, of this topic? Let's so, Aldrich, who is in the back, could you? Yes, great. So what do you think of the French-German plan, including a recovery fund of 500 billion? Is you can have one of three options. One, it's too little and too late. Two, this is just about right and what we need. Uh, or C, um, and there are many Dutch viewers among us, unnecessarily ambitious. So let me see. We wait for a second for you to make your choice. And then see. If what we get as a result. Uh, Aldrich, do we have a result to show? Just about right is the main answer on the, on this question. Uh, 59%. 29% says it's too little, too late. And yes, there are some Dutch among our viewers who say, no, it's unnecessarily ambitious. That's a, a good start. Well, thank you for uh, Aldrich for showing this poll. Um, he's one member of my team at the back of this meeting. Now we go to Luis uh, Garicano. Thank you, Luis, for uh, for joining us. We are in an exciting very time. Much, very pleasure. We have just seen the French German proposal. Um, next week, we expect the Commission proposal. Uh, you have been very outspoken from the start. How do you see the current situation? Are the proposals going in the right direction? What do you want to improve? Please feel free to have your take on the, on the current situation. Um, so, uh, just to give a bit of background to to our to our viewers, uh, Europe has already been acting and and, and and doing some steps for a little while. The main tool Europe has right now, the only institution that really is able to act fast, is the European Central Bank. And so, the first line of defense 
has been a big package that European Central Bank put together. It's called PEPP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Fund, where program where the ECB says there's 750 billion worth of assets that we're going to buy, we're going to to uh, to intervene to support these 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 borrowers. There's a second line of defense which is also liquidity, which comes from the governments uh, in the form of the Eurogroup, and those are some other packages that involved a package to support unemployment schemes, uh, the SHORE program, uh, one to support the um, uh, small businesses in Europe, the European Investment Bank, and one to support governments, which is the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism. Those are all packages that Europe has put in place. Uh, the second set of packages hasn't still started injecting money, but they are already in place. But many of us uh, have Oh, uh, Luis, I'm afraid you have been frozen right now, so your connection is... Luis, if you hear us, it's in fact good. It's not the worst picture you could uh, you could think it of. Yes, back. Now, you're... now it comes yeah, back. Yeah, is it back? It's back? Yeah, okay, back. I apologize to the viewers. Uh, uh, so, so I was saying that the third step, the third leg, is the one that Parliament passed last week, and that France and Germany are are now putting something similar over the table. What we passed with the votes of of, of the Social Democratic uh, group to which Paul belongs, uh, with the, also the Popular Party, the, to, to which the Christian Democrats uh, in in Holland belong, with also ECR, the more right wing, and also the Greens, more left wing. These five groups said we need something large, something much more significant that actually involves grants, not loans. And you probably, Paul, want, want to talk about it later. The idea is if you want to get countries to grow together, you can't just give them more loans. They just The mountain of borrowing will grow and grow. You need to have a program at the European level that invests in the recovery. Uh, when we put this on the table, well, I must say it was, it was potentially far-fetched, but I am quite pleased, Paul, to, 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 uh, to see what um, my, um, President uh, Macron and Chancellor Merkel have put on the table. I think it's a really huge step forward for Europe to see a big package, 500 billion. So the size is right, or it starts to come nearly right, 500 billion. The way it is, it's grants, not loans, so that's also good. And it's European investment. It's not investment that is going to come at the intergovernmental level, like after the Euro crisis, but it's Europe, it's, it's investment that comes through the European Parliament, the European Commission, at the European level for a European recovery. Okay. And Luis, why do you think uh, where, uh, the 500 billion is in the, the, the German French proposal? The European Parliament, and you were one of the negotiators on, the, on that resolution, uh, had a different figure in mind, which was more. Yes. Two trillion, or for the fewer, two thousand uh, bill, uh, billion. How do you see the difference between the two uh, two numbers? Is this? Um... It's interesting how the two trillion, uh, how the two trillion came about. The the, the uh, your your viewers, our viewers will be will be interested to know that it was we were trying to negotiate for a one trillion figure of grants. Uh, the Popular Party doesn't want to hear about one trillion of grants. So what they offered us was to go to two trillion, but then not to say of grants, but of grants and loans. And that's, you know, better than me, you've been negotiating for many years, these, mm. these kinds of things. Sometimes going to a larger figure allows to, to, to settle because we didn't specifically said one trillion of, of grants. We said two trillion and then next article, mostly grants. So the figure that the parliament really settled on would be around one trillion of grants, I would think. Um, this package still not closed. It will also have loans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it will come, I think, with the ESM, with all the other things. It will come close to maybe one, one and a half trillion, and of which 500 is, is grants. It comes not so far when you actually interpret properly the resolution. We still, I mean, we would like it larger for sure, but it's a, it's mm -hmm. a very, very, it's a very good step for Europe that for the first time, European governments and Germany in particular set up a, a the idea of joint borrowing for the European Union as a big instrument of recovery. Okay. 
And and can you uh, explain to the to the viewers why do you think it's important that we have this step? Uh, because you could argue we have the ECB stepping in, we have the loan package. Uh, why do we need this package in particular, and why of this size? So to help us, you're an economist here, just lay but lay it down in layman's terms. So why do you think this is important? It could be a political argument, it could be economic argument. You're free, but. Yeah, for me, for me, the argument is really economic. I can see political arguments to show Europe solidarity and so on, but there really is an economic argument. And uh, I, I wrote something on the on the NRSA uh, yesterday, uh, uh, the yep. Dutch newspaper, laying out a bit of the the the, the self-interested case for solidarity. And, and the self-interested case for solidarity for for other countries for for all Europe is basically that we want the recovery to exist. We don't want to leave a country. Please be. Louise, you're freezing again, I'm afraid. Louise. Ah. And for the it's few, a, oh yeah, there you are. There you're back again. I am Go back, on. I am, okay. So I uh, I I usually use this for Zoom and there's usually not a problem, but it seems like today is not. <laughs> it's probably it's probably Netflix time already. Started. Maybe that's it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe everybody's. <laughs> so, 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 so the economic case is. Uh, I mean, the, many countries, particularly Northern Europe, are, are are winning big time from from the European single market. We've had years of growth, but look at Italy. Italy has three decades in which it has no per capita income growth. So Italy is exactly as poor or as rich three decades ago. And and here's a really shocking fact of. Of viewers from Northern Europe, probably. Italy has had a primary budget surplus for 29 out of the last 30 years, meaning, except for one year, Italy has always put more money in than spent. People think, oh, Italy's, Italians are always spending too much. That's not the case. What has happened is that Italy has had a huge step of a hand. It has had the primary surplus trying to pay the interest. The debt keeps growing because you don't grow as a country and you get into these vicious circles where you're trying to pay you. Debt and you don't grow. We don't want that to happen to all, all of the countries hit by this crisis. We don't want to have this huge mountain of debt stops growth and eventually can affect very negatively growth in Europe and the stability of the euro. You need a plan of a size that is similar to the heat that we're getting in our economies. We think that the economies in Europe are going to get a 1, 1. 1.5 trillion hit. Well, a plan of that order of magnitude would be necessary to compensate for that heat. Yeah. And uh, for the viewers, it's good to know that uh, Luis is also a, a quarter time Dutch, I would say, something like that. You're, uh, you're everyone's yes, every quarter month. time. Yes, a quarter time Dutch. Yes. Can you speak a bit of Dutch, right or not? Maybe you can. can... Yeah, yeah, that can I a bit of 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 a Klein dingetjes, uh, kinderen dings, dan kan ik het wel een uh, beetje. Uh, it's perfect. It's so much better than my Spanish, uh, Luis. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed. <laughs> and it was interesting to see what you wrote. You wrote an article for the viewers who haven't seen the article in, in the NSA yesterday, together with Enrico Perotto, who is a professor of finance at the University of Amsterdam, Italian in the, in the Netherlands. And you make the argument that in fact indeed that Italy hasn't benefited from the euro which is the same claim that the populists like uh, like uh, like from Lake are making Italy by the way they are against the euro uh, and that's affected the Netherlands benefits to a large extent from the euro right so that's the argument that you try to, uh, to, try yes. to develop in that article as well we don't, we don't really uh, say that Italy at all uh, shouldn't be in the euro. I mean, there's not a equivalent we make. I think it's good that Italy is in the euro, but that it hasn't worked much to their advantage. Basically, for Holland, what the Netherlands, what it means is that the weaker some countries become, like Italy and Spain, the more there's downward pressure on the euro, and the more industrial economies that are able to export very well, that have a lot of power in the foreign markets, the more they benefit from an undervalued euro. So to some extent, the big current account surpluses that Germany and Netherlands have developed over these years have to do with the fact that they they benefit precisely from the weekend, from the weakness of some other members that came in and maybe overvalued and that actually have 
seeing this vicious circle in which they uh, they can't get out of out of the debt overhang and they can't devalue their way out of this and basically uh, have been struggling to to grow indeed. What is it? Um, the question I, I have on that uh, for the for the understanding. Um, why can't Italy grow? Couldn't they, for example, lower their wages? Because that's one of what you see in, a, in the case of Italy, that the wage cost per unit of production has, has risen, whereas it's more or less flat in the Netherlands. Or did they spend too much? For example, the Dutch save more than Italy. Is that not an explanation of the, the current account differences? How do you, is it impossible for Italy the, to the... come back, so to say? No, no. I think that I think that there is a mix of internal and external factors. Indeed, there are clearly, if you look at Spain, which is a country that I know much better than Italy, but I think it's true for Italy sure. as well. Um, and there are some some reforms that these countries need to make. There is no question about it. But there is also no question that uh, that the people feel, particularly in Italy, that they have spent a lot of years uh, making these efforts. And that they haven't paid off. On the internal side, I would think the main reforms have to do with the educational systems and the labor markets. Uh, these countries have, the Netherlands also to some extent actually, these countries have extremely dual labor markets. They have insiders and outsiders, Spain and, 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 and Italy. Um, insiders are quite protected. They have a relatively uh, high termination, labor, labor termination cost and quite protected contracts. Outsiders are in temporary contracts. The moment anything goes wrong, all the outsiders get fired and lose their jobs. They, they don't get fired. The contracts don't get renewed, basically. And so um, the, the, the way that this has worked is that the outsiders, the ones on temporary contracts, don't get training, don't increase their productivity. They're a bit used like Kleenex, not, not really given the, the, the long-term perspectives, but just the employers kind of tend to terminate them anything goes wrong. So labor markets is something that needs to be reformed and we've been working very hard at it. Uh, educational systems also have this, this duality with a lot of, of early uh, dropout rates. It, the Netherlands, I think one of the, the very uh, good things of the Dutch educational system, one that I appreciate uh, whenever I see uh, parents of kids and I talk to them, is that with this gradation of the different uh, professional training and the, and the VVD, VVO and all that, you have a, a very good um, exit for the people who don't have a good exit. So, so the people who don't want to go to college or to high school, uh, to college or to uni, have good, also good outcomes. And in countries uh, like Spain, Italy, uh, there is really not a very clear professional education path or not a very attractive one. So, so those would be education and, 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 and and uh, a labor market, those two reforms that need to happen. And I, I've been fighting for them. And so I, I, I don't want to try to argue that, that there is nothing that needs to change in those countries, like nobody should argue that, that the Netherlands is doing everything right, of course, uh, particularly co concerning corporate taxes. But uh, but but the, the, the main issue is we have to decide as Europeans, do we want to belong to an entity together? And there is, has to be a degree of fiscal solidarity and, and responsibility and willingness to, to carry our own loads, no question about it. Or do we think we shouldn't? But we are in this strange limbo where the countries kind of are tied together by this currency, uh, but they don't want to acknowledge that they are tied together. And the truth is, there is no such a thing as a Dutch or a Spanish or Italian economy anymore. We really belong to a Eurozone that actually has a very synchronized uh, economic cycle. Uh, and the reading your NSA article with uh, with Parotti, uh, you clearly make the argument it's in the best interest of the Netherlands to have a European program. Uh, and this is what you try to explain now. Uh, otherwise, countries like not just Italy, but also Spain or Portugal may get stuck in, uh, in a low growth uh, environment. And we, we see divergence in Europe, and this will not be the argument you, uh, you built here. Um, but what struck me when I read the article is that you very much put the argument to say it's in the best interest of the Netherlands itself, right? Was that also a sort of implicit um, um, criticism at the Southern European leaders that said we 
want solidarity, we demand solidarity. Um, it, yes, it should, is, should actually, they, it is. Could they, could, they, could, could they have made a difference? Could uh, Sanchez, Pedro Sanchez or uh, uh, Conte, the Italian Premier, uh, Prime Minister, made the argument very differently? I think they should have, Paul. I, I think that uh, Varoufakis uh, wrote a, a tweet that I retweeted, which I, yeah. I, I was I was almost surprised myself, saying exactly this: that that the the um, the case that has to be made is not the case of solidarity. I mean, the the, the basic case uh, is not like oh, we are good and we want to help each other, because obviously people want to help themselves. I mean, the Dutch people want help from the Netherlands to go to the Dutch people, and that's totally normal. Uh, the case that has to be made is, let's have a program together, a European program that is going to lead to a European recovery. And the Netherlands is a very export-driven economy. If Europe gets stuck in low growth rut, uh, it's going to be bad for the Netherlands. And we want to all try to move together out of this. And, and I think uh, if you talk about, for example, the, um, how is it called, the Delft project, the Hyperloop, right? The Netherlands has been invested a lot in this Hyperloop, in this idea of a tra new transport, clean transport, clean, very fast transport systems. Well, that's a European project that should get funded by big European program money and that we would all have to accomplish together. Um, there are these defense uh, um, administration agency in the US, the DARPA, which was responsible for everything from the internet to the nuclear program. We need an agency in Europe that undertakes European programs, that is ambitious, and that helps all of Europe be leading in technology and digitalization, etc. These are ideas that I think would be much more attractive and much more easy to kind of explain to Northern European publics than to say, oh, we come here with a hand. No, that's not how we come. And I don't think that's, that's right. And I have also forcefully made the, 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 the argument in Spain, indeed. So yes, it is implicit criticism to, to Sanchez and Conte, indeed. Um, and I have one specific question for you from the audience, uh, from Jorge Garayo, uh, who thanks you for all the work in recent years, but how do you see the current allocation system should work? That's one of the questions. Um, um, how do you estimate uh, how much do you estimate would be requested from Italy and Spain and those hardest hit countries? So, so um, I think that we should think of it as, I mean, uh, Macron said for the hardest hit sectors and the hardest hit countries. I think we should think of, of the money mostly related to the economic damage, but I was saying it should be European money. For me, the really important thing is that it's not going to be just the transfer to a country to spend as they want. I think this would be the wrong thing. I think it should be a, a European program that is run from Europe so that there is no suspicions from any country that, oh, these are doing it, using it for the wrong reason. That should have uh, some reformed reciprocities, that we should encourage these countries to undertake reforms, and that should be um, linked to potential sectors with damage. I think tourism is an obvious sector where uh, Greece and Portugal, for example, have been very affected by COVID, but they are two of the four countries that will have largest job losses because tourism is so important and tourism is going to suffer very much. So if you link it to those sectors and to those impacts of the COVID, I don't think you need to necessarily link it to the country, but to, to the damage. And then, then let's see which countries actually get the okay. benefit. But okay. And Jakob, uh, for the audience who is wondering where is Jakob from Weizsäcker, I my understanding is that uh, the German bureaucracy, so to say, is blocking uh, the code webinar software on his computer, <laughs> but he's here. <laughs> but, 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 but the good thing is he has uh, now joined us in the uh, ATND, so he can, uh, he can uh, do his contribution, not, on, uh, not with video, but just with sound, uh, which is actually fine. But before we go to Jakob, one more question by Peter van der Gaas for you, Louise. Um, is making the argument uh, that we should also look at the costs for uh, for the Netherlands. But is, uh, will this become a burden for the poor and middle class turning their back on Europe and the euro? That's the worry by Peter van der Gaat. I hope you understand. We have the cost yes. of the, the pandemic recovery plans. Um, will the cost be bore, uh, borne by 
the lower people with low in, and middle incomes turning their back on Europe. How do you see I that? Think the middle income, I think the middle income people would get a bigger cost if the export industries of the Netherlands suffer and they lose their jobs. But people, hey, Jacob. Wow, that is, he's in, see, he's uh, in, it's you, amazing. You defeated the German bureaucracy, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that it was hard yeah, Luis, to connect, so it's very good. Luis, so just answer this question, and we turn to Jakob. Um, yeah. So, so, so I would say that what people we shouldn't we shouldn't think in these narrow accounting terms that trapped the Brits at the end. The Brits were obsessed by how much am I putting, how much am I getting paid, instead of thinking what is the benefit of being the European Union. And it's the cost of the the benefit of the European Union against the cost of the European Union, not the benefit of the transfer that I get. And so all of these people will be happy if Europe grows, if Europe advances, and we shouldn't be thinking narrowly of what's the extra additional euro. I could be belonging to a club that goes from 10 to 20 euros the, the fee, and I might be very happy because the club is giving me bigger benefits. So I think the obsession with net transfers is a wrong obsession because there are lots of public goods that we're all getting together that help us all grow together. Okay, thank you, Luis and uh, Jakob. Well, welcome uh, to this uh, to this webinar. It's good that you have uh, was st was still able to join us. I was, uh, um, and you have a busy life, I imagine, in this in, in this time uh, working. Chief Economist at Ministry of Finance. I've introduced your net close advisor to uh, to Olaf Scholz. Um, the German French proposal has just been uh, released. We were going towards the Commission proposal on the May, uh, next Wednesday. Uh, can you give um, what's on top of your mind? Can you give the viewers a quick take on how you see the situation, what you hope for, what you fear? Uh, we have just discussed with Luis about the size of the program, but also how it should be spent. We come back to the question how it should be financed. That's a question I still have, but Feel free to have your take on the situation, and we uh, we have the discussion from there. Well, I think the most important thing um, is um, that everybody understands in Europe that these are highly exceptional times. This is not normal. This is exceptional, and exceptional times require exceptional measures. Um, and um, I'm delighted uh, that uh, Germany and France managed to come together to put forward a proposal. Let me be very clear, that there's no illusion either in Berlin or in Paris that in France coming together in, in itself is a sufficient condition for anything to work in Europe. Um, I wouldn't even say it's a necessary condition, but I would definitely say um, that's what history teaches us. It's helpful. You know, if, if Europe wants to get things off the ground and, and, and uh, Paris and Berlin are um, not able, not even Paris and Berlin are able to, to come together, it's going to be very hard. So I find it extremely encouraging um, that uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, France and Germany were able to come together with this proposal. Um, and I think it's politically sound because it, it, it does justice um, uh, with this recovery fund proposal to the exceptional situation we're in. And I think it's institutionally sound on many levels. Let me start with a trivial, a trivial observation. There was a discussion before, um, uh, and it's still ongoing, whether the recovery fund should in fact be um, grant-based or credit-based. Um, and uh, I fear um, that some of the people who said uh, said it's going, uh, going to have to be credit-based um, decided to say that because they felt, well, some other countries were telling us that the ESM was not an acceptable vehicle to borrow. And therefore, um, an argument could be made, well, if the ESM is not an option, then we need to create a substitute to a borrowing capacity, which would have implied a credit-based system. Now, I think um, conceptually, we are a little bit beyond that stage where we realize that the way in which the ESM program is now accessible to member states is a sound way to utilize the institution of the ESM for borrowing capacity. Therefore, 
a recovery fund does not need to replicate uh, such a facility, but needs to complement it. Um, and I think that's the way in which the Franco-German uh, proposal is structured. That's, uh, and I think that's a good thing. Um, and when you have accepted the fact that in order to complement uh, what we already have with the ESM, it's useful to have a grants-based approach in this exceptional situation, uh, and then, of course, uh, um, uh, the question is, what's, what's the value added? And 500, uh, 500 billion is a very big number, but if you compare it to the size of uh, um, your area or EU GDP, it's not colossal. It won't solve all problems. And everybody knows that, but it's, it's not symbolic. It's real. It's a real quantity of money. We shouldn't belittle it. So it, so it can be effective, and I think it can be effective in two ways. First of all, it can be effective to convince, um, especially those Europeans in the most affected regions and most affected countries, that um, Europe is in this together. Um, and there, there had been some doubts earlier, and I think it's very, very important that everybody in, in Europe can see Europe is in this together. And at the same time, I think it's very important that's not, uh, if you like, a, a signal to um, uh, European citizens, but to financial markets that Europe is in this together, in the sense that if some, something bad happens and that nobody, no country in the world is responsible uh, for COVID-19, so if so something bad happens, we will um, stick together, we will help each other, even in countries um, that went into the crisis with relatively high debt levels, which of course is a challenge in its own right, and it becomes an even bigger challenge um, when, when such a crisis hits you. And I think um, that will uh, 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 serve well uh, to persuade financial markets that they shouldn't get overly nervous. Um, and so I think um, that, that's, that's useful. And let me add a third point that I think is also useful. Olaf Scholz yesterday talked about a Hamiltonian moment mm. in the context of that proposal. And, and the reason why he did that is, of course, um, again, it, 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 you could look at it technically. It's the way in which the proposal says the money should be borrowed. It should be borrowed within the framework of the European budget. Um, the, pro the proposal is also quite clear that it should be borrowed not permanently, but, but as a temporary response to a temporary crisis. But nevertheless, um, it would be a major step for the institutional development of the European Union if we get used to the idea that in such circumstances, it can make sense uh, to do this, to borrow together. Um, and so um, I think on three levels, um, this is a very sensible uh, um, approach, and I just hope um, that it will be possible um, to uh, find a European consensus around this ambitious proposal. And, and that's not a done deal. And, and of course, we follow um, also domestic developments in the coalition government in, in the Netherlands closely. And, and, and we're delighted to see that there's a discussion now um, on, um, on how, how the Netherlands will position the, the, the Dutch government will position itself, and, and of course they are very, very keen to see how other governments will position themselves in the context of that. Yeah. Um, um, can I can I ask one question, Paul, from sure. Jacob? Uh, this Jacob, uh, I, uh, congratulations on the proposal. I, I was I was really impressed that this could be accomplished, and every, everybody who's been involved should be very congratulated. So, so so great job. Um, but uh, you, would you consider? Would, would would you think that it would be on the table if uh, countries were dragging their feet or blackmailing or asking or whatever it is for things that weren't reasonable? Let's say uh, coming from different places, and I won't be. I won't be more precise than that. Um, but the possibility of having a approach that would be few countries and intergovernmental be an alternative if these things get bogged down into the European process or not. What's your view on that? Well, my view is that um, if one um, did not manage to uh, reach a consensus, and, and, and again, this is a proposal um, and there will be negotiations and hopefully 
in terms of functionality, these three features which I mentioned, that's not every detail of the proposal, but these three features, I think they're essential. Um, and if one were to think it through, the third feature, namely this institutional progress inside the union, if you like the Hamiltonian moment, would clearly be lost um, if um, indeed um, a, a consensus couldn't be forged around that, because in order to, for that to work, um, every single member state will have to agree and take a, a decision accordingly. Um, and I fear also, if you think of the second feature, which I mentioned, um, a strong signal, much more than symbolic, but real signal to um, uh, um, uh, um, um, Europeans in the affected regions, and to financial markets, if not all countries are in this together, I fear the signal, again, would be significantly weakened. Um, so I, uh, I don't think uh, it would be wise to go down that route. Okay. Hey, Jakob, um, can you give us some, well, I would say inside view on how things worked in Berlin? Because this was not uh, easy to achieve. Uh, it was not easy to achieve a deal between Germany and France, between Berlin and Paris, but also inside Berlin, you must have had quite some discussion. Um, uh, but to have the two parties, the two governing parties, uh, the SPD and CDU, to bring them together, how did how did they come together? Can you give uh, share some insight on uh, what brought these? Because I think they started with different point of views, right? What do you think was decisive for uh, for that? Well, I, I mean, um, I, I, <laughs> the, yeah, so I I won't go into the details, but I no, think no, no, I, no, of the, key, um, the the key here is um, that um, I think uh, France and Germany and the French government uh, internally and the German government internally um, managed to rise to the challenge. Um, um, uh, and of course, it's perfectly legitimate on these matters to have different perspectives, to have different views. But um, I think the challenge is that right now, um, the status quo, doing nothing, is simply not acceptable. It's not an acceptable answer to the challenge that we're confronted with by COVID-19, to the challenge we're confronted with together. And um, I think that's the insight, the widespread insight. Um, and I don't think this is about party politics. This is about people coming together and understanding doing nothing is not an option. Um, we have to come up with a constructive proposal. And, uh, and I hope we did. Um, and I would very much hope that the same spirit that, uh, you know, when, when you have all European countries coming together, it's even mm. harder. But I think if the spirit um, of agreeing that um, doing nothing, failing to, uh, to agree on a constructive answer to the cha challenge we're confronted with at the European level is not an option, I think then um, there's a chance uh, that uh, the key features of that proposal could be preserved when, when, when it, it is taken to the European level. And, uh, and we are looking forward with great eagerness, of course, uh, to the 27th of May, when the Commission, and, and that's, of course, uh, 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 central to the whole process, um, uh, um, come up with their proposal. Yeah, okay, thank you. I, I would, I think, for the viewers, I want to cover at least two topics. First is, how should the deal be financed? Uh, there's a discussion on own resources, on uh, the depth, uh, the duration of the debt. The Spanish has proposed uh, perpetuals. And I want to go. Uh, I want to to stop to focus briefly on that, and then also go into the question: uh, How do we uh, convince the Fugo Four? Because that's one of the key questions, of course. Uh, but let's first on um, uh, on the financing of the uh, of the debt. It, it, the Commission will issue debt. It will be, uh, but it will raise. Um, uh, this will. There will be revenue raised for interest and redemption. How do you see that, Jacob, in the, 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 the German-French proposal has some words on that? Um, can you elaborate on that? And please, Louise, feel free to, uh, to join in on, on this. Well, I mean, technically, of course, um, there's, of course, always the budget decision, and then there's the sort of um, the expenditure decision, often a, a little bit later. 
um, which is not uh, is sort of strictly time bound to the seven year limit. Um, uh, but in order for this to, to fly, uh, um, this uh, expenditure decision uh, jointly, um, uh, including uh, um, a decision to um, uh, um, uh, use credit as a financing instrument, will have to be agreed, and it will have to be agreed and decided upon in such a way um, that the seven-year um, uh, multi-annual financial framework limit is not a problem in terms of the duration of the debt. That's not to say so that there are no misunderstandings. <laughs> we're not talking about consoles. We're not talking about perpetual debt. Uh, but um, we would be talking, uh, I think, reasonably uh, about a 10 to 20 a year time period, which is more than seven. So the yeah. technical problem, I think you are, uh, it, 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 we want to look at together is how do we make certain that this is credible um, beyond a seven year time horizon? And our assessment is that is, is doable, but this needs to be part of the compromise. And, uh, and let, me, let me add this uh, sort of with regards to your second question. What about um, uh, different parts of Europe coming together with previously different perspectives. I don't think we are doing ourselves a favor, even though, um, Paul, we were in, in, in the European Parliament together and owing to our last lives actually often sitting next to one another, which was a great pleasure. Um, uh, and uh, we may have certain views, but I think in order to make real progress on this, um, it is essential that everybody agrees this is a time-bound exercise in a highly exceptional situation where people who may hold slightly different views on sort of the longer term objectives for the development of the European institutional framework, who may have different fiscal outlooks in normal times and have different views on the degree to which there ought to be solidarity at the European level, they can come together in this exceptional moment and make it work. So, so my key recommendation would be not to try and fight old battles. <laughs> I mean, mm. it's always tempting to come back to old battles or to look at um, a, a, a such a, a unique situation um, a, a, a through the lens, a lens of old battles. But I don't think that's helpful. I think what is helpful is to say we have a special situation um, and in this special situation, we need a solution that works. And um, I think everybody can be happy, um, it, it, irrespective of their precise political lenient, leanings, that if we come up with a solution that works, this will instill confidence that if ever in future crises we find ourselves in similar situations, it, it would take a, a little bit less time to come up with a solution because we would have a blueprint. Um, and I think this is what this is about in terms of institutional development to have a blueprint, what we do with that, I don't think has to be decided in this stage. And in fact, I would advise trying to decide about it at this stage of the political process. Okay, so I, I will, if you allow me, Paul, okay, please do. I will try sure. to push, uh, to, to answer as well and to push Jacob uh, to a tiny bit more transparency on what he's, he's asking us to do. So, so basically my answer would be first, uh, uh, I, we, I was one of the proponents of, of consoles, of long-term, of very long-term debt. Uh, I am not pushing that now. I mean, the, I think the, the resolution of the problem, we talked about long date debt and the kind of durations that uh, if we get a 20-year average duration, I think that's sensible and that's good in terms of giving financial stability and locking in the low rates, which we have now, which would be great. But the question is how are we going to pay for that? And I think for the interest and the principle on this debt. And there are two possible interpretations of the paper and of, of how to proceed now. And I wanted Jacob to, to, to stand a little bit more clear on this. One interpretation is that I have been pushing, but I'm happy to, to listen up, uh, which is, look, if you want this Hamiltonian moment, you need to give the European Union the own resources to pay this debt. I mean, basically, you cannot just say, oh, I'm going to borrow this much and not have your own resources and depend on the contributions of member states. Second possibility, which I think you might be hinting at, so on resources, just for, for our viewers, just to be very clear, there's a certain set of things that are very difficult for individual member states to tax. These are, these are inefficiencies, money that holds, uh, falls through the holes, like, you know, e-commerce platforms, things like that. 
where if Europe comes together, it's more efficient fiscally. Europe has a lot of value added in doing that. It's also fairer and it eliminates distortions because we, we get a better, lay, a, le, a better level playing field. Those are own resources, digital taxation, potentially a financial transaction tax, potentially green taxes, etc. The parliament has asked for that and the resolution we all negotiated two weeks ago, we, we put those on. Another possibility to say, okay, leave the own resources discussion for later, focus on getting the plan now, and let's see in the future how we pay for this. What's Jacob, what's your, your intervention asking us in some sense, Paul and me on the other ones, to leave this for later? Is this how you see it? I think um, uh, obviously what, what what is the critical decision is that one has a decision on. Um, I mean, I'm referring to Article 311, sort of if you want to be precise. Uh, and yes, indeed, on own resources, but um, um, uh, there there has to be decision uh, for the ceiling of of the resources and the categories. Um, right now, debt is not a category uh, uh, which is there, and in order to have um, something that works. Um, I, I believe um, there needs to be a decision along these lines, um, and I'm looking forward, to, of course, to the Commission proposal, and um, uh, will tell us a, a little bit more uh, about how, how this could be done, hopefully. Um, um, but uh, um, logically, um, it, it, let me tell, it, tell you this uh, um, uh, from a country which has federalism. Um, it is possible to have uh, taxes that are going to one or the other part of, uh, of a federal government. It is possible to have revenue sharing of these taxes and it is also possible to have, for example, G, G, it, 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 um, gross national income or GDP or whatever um, index contributions. Um, and I think all of these are legitimate ways to fund a, 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 a federal system. There's nothing um, intrinsically good or intrinsically bad about one or the other, um, but what one can certainly say in a system where tax authorities are national, or in the case of Germany, even to some extent regional, um, if one only has a system that conditions on tax revenues, there could be problematic incentives for um, tax authorities in the execution of tax legislation to say, well, this part of the money doesn't uh, go to us directly, it goes to somebody else. And so let's not be after uh, those taxes as intensively as we are after others. So um, um, my answer to your question is, um, uh, the important thing is that the European Union is funded in a sound way. And there's, uh, there are good reasons for, for, for own resources beyond you know, customs revenues. Um, but um, it, when you look at the details of it all, it is also important to try and think about how, how exactly this work would work in practice in a system which is different from a, a normal uh, sort of country um, uh, uh, where, where um, the control of the tax authorities is not technically speaking at the European level. Uh, and so I think that's, that's, that's a feature that needs to be borne in mind when thinking about the right mix of funding um, at, at the European level. But that's not at all to say uh, um, I wouldn't look favorably uh, um, uh, personally at uh, increasing um, uh, the sort of access of, um, of the European Union to taxation. But this needs to be done in a, in a reasonable way. And of course, it needs to be done in a way where not only the power to tax, but also uh, certain responsibilities then are moved uh, to the European level as well which again is a discussion I don't think we can have during this crisis because we need an answer and we need it fast. Um, but these are questions that come along when one seriously, yeah. and I think that's what you uh, are intent on doing, um, and, and Paul and myself, if we st seriously had to start to think about longer run fiscal federalism for the European Union, these are uh, questions we need to look at very, very seriously because if we don't get them right, um, Alexander Hamilton made a lot, lot of progress in terms of federalism, but maybe he didn't get everything right. Um, uh, uh, um, we, uh, these mistakes can be very costly, even in historical terms. So, so we, we really need to think them through. Okay. 
Thank you, Jakob. And this, um, uh, and since we have uh, roughly 20 minutes less, let's turn to the difficult question, what do we do with the Frugal 4? Because any discussion on own resources, federal taxation, won't make the debate in uh, the Netherlands, I think, easier, I would say. My, uh, but let, let's bring in the viewers by introducing a poll. Um, um, Aldrich, who is in the background, could you produce this poll? Uh, and let me ask you what the viewers think of it. What should be done to convince the frugal member states to agree with EU recovery package? And there are four options you can choose from. Uh, don't budge and just exert maximum political pressure. Just let them, uh, let them. they should just give in. Uh, the second option, give them a re big rebate on the EU contributions. Uh, the third option, all money raised through EU debt should be spent on loans. So they can stick to their original position or reduce an ambition of proposal on controversial issues like it has been discussed right now uh, it, that they think of own resources or uh, or other taxation measures. And it's now up for you, for the viewers to uh, to pick their choice, one, two, three or four, which is, uh, I think, covers most of the options that are on the table. And then after this poll, we continue the discussion with uh, Luis and Jacob how do we convince the frugal member states? And, and of course, I'm very interested also in hearing from, let's say, uh, a German and a Spanish per perspective, how they see the, the, the political position of the Netherlands in the European Union mm -hmm. after the debate has been so fierce between countries. And I'm not sure where we are in the poll. I think we are close to, we can close the poll, I think. There we go. So, uh, let's say at roughly, oh, that's in, in uh, both 39%. Uh, so, uh, two answers uh, come out of it. Uh, put a maximum pressure on the, the frugal uh, member states. Uh, like Jacob said, this is the Hamiltonian moment. Uh, we need to come together. Just stick to that, put pressure on them. But also uh, roughly 40% of the viewers say, no, 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 we shouldn't spend it on grants, but uh, we should spend it on uh, uh, on loans. And that's uh, how, uh, so the audience is divided on this. Uh, thank you for showing this. Let's go back to uh, Louise and uh, Jacob. There you are again, uh, at least on my screen. Um, Louise, your have a close connection to the Netherlands. Um, so how do you see the debate? I will, you, you did your attempt already in uh, the NSA article. Um, how are we gonna convince uh, the, the Dutch government, so to say? There, there is a basic problem for Europe and we, we always, uh, those who do politics, all three of us have done them at the European level, confronted, which is that there is not a European public opinion formation process like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the NBC and CNN, where everybody in the US watches the same thing, arrives to a conclusion more or less together. Uh, we have very different rhetoric, very different words used, a very different framing on, on things that make communication very difficult. It's it's very hard for me to, to, uh, to reach uh, to, to incorporate and reach Dutch opinion or for Paul, for you or for Jacob to reach uh, Spanish public opinion and, and, and vice versa. I mean, basically, public opinions are completely isolated from each other. And this is one of those moments where you most notice it, that um, there is those misunderstandings that grow. Uh, uh, Hoekstra, Minister Hoekstra makes a comment. It's kind of maybe not super fortunate comment, but it's not really badly meant, but then uh, in the other place, it explodes into a, some sort of really big misunderstanding. So, um, I, I think that what we need is, is, is factual uh, exchanging, uh, try to contain emotions. Uh, it's very easy for people in these moments, for populists to rile up people, rather not just people don't get rile up themselves, and to and to have a little bit the ability to see beyond topics. I mean, uh, you, I don't know. Uh, People often forget that the 
Greece has the longest working hours. That's uh, what I was saying before. Italy has 29 out of the last 30 years has had a budget, a primary budget surplus. People don't know that. So to try to move beyond the topic, and for those of us who are in a position to to participate in the, in the debate, to always try to stop those those slides into kind of topics where I remember Minister Dyselblum uh, talking how we were going to spend everything in wine and, and parties or something. Uh, oh, so you, oh, you so do remember those. Okay. I think that. Yes, yes, that was very notorious in Spain. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so, so a lot of it has to do with the ability to, that those of us who can reach a public opinion in our countries to resist that pressure. When, when it comes to the Netherlands and Spain, I try to put forward what the Dutch people are concerned about and why we think, for example, that reforms are crucial, that economy has to change, that we have to be responsible with using money, etc. And, and, and I think that that's, that's the best way to try to do it. But the truth is that Europe has this basic weakness that if I want to write an op-ed, like the one I wrote yesterday in NSA, and say, I want to write an op-ed that will be read in Berlin, in Amsterdam, in Paris, and in Madrid, there is no way to do it. And, and that fundamental miscommunication or lack of communication between public opinions makes this reaching out exercises really, really complicated. I, I really don't, don't have a very good solution. No, no, no but, but be the devil's advocate, uh, Louise. Uh, the European Parliament, and including myself, we very much emphasize our resources. Jakob is stressing now, but we need also a pragmatic solution. Could it be the case that introducing own resources, federal taxation, will make it more complicated? To, uh, to come to an agreement on, uh, but, uh, among the member states. How do you see that? Uh, this, is a, this is a great point. I mean, Jakob was, was, I think, arguing for, for leaving this for a little bit of a later stage. And I can see that that's maybe, that's maybe a smart thing. I haven't, made, I haven't heard the argument made explicitly, and, and I don't know if, if that's, that's the argument. I mean, I think that if by, if by trying to link the two things together, we're going to kill both, Maybe we want to pass first the recovery plan, the MFF, and then decide on the own resources. That's that's possible. I I wouldn't be opposed to 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 finding the politically most uh, reasonable way because at the end of the day, what we want is our citizens to enjoy a fast and and uh, and safe recovery, uh, to rescue health uh, lives and rescue jobs. That's that's our job, and and I am I am I would be willing to. Uh, to, to consider that. I mean, that was not my position. That was not the position in the resolution of Parliament two weeks ago. We were very clear that we thought of things. The recovery plan, the MFF, the own resources to fund both uh, sure. would be linked. Well, my view, that, but... well, well let, me, let, me ask, let me tell you what my view is and ask for your opinion in Jacobs. My view was, here's a grand bargain. We're offering, Parliament is offering countries this deal. You will not have to pay more out of GNI. It's frozen. We will get these new sources of taxation that will increase efficiency in the economies. Don't you think that politically, for your constituents, constituent, for those, your fellow citizens, this is politically a reasonable thing to say? Nobody contributes more. We just made polluters and digitech companies pay more. I'm, I'm personally, I'm happy to make this argument, and I will try to make this argument in uh, in my country. It's, I think uh, the the taxes that uh, are the ready candidates for own resources are indeed um, aiming at big corporates, which already pay li too little taxes, as we know. So we could have uh, the we could have a reform of the European uh, tax uh, corporate tax system, but we could also have a front runner of that. I myself make a plea for a single market levy. But it would also be very good if we uh, would start to uh, to tax pollution. I think we could make the. I'm happy to go out and try to convince the Dutch to make this case. But I also see there are some inherent um, um, uh, distrust uh, in in, uh, in what what it will imply. That you already saw in um, the part-time unemployment scheme that was proposed by the Commission. The sure that the Dutch government uh, takes very long to position now it must be temporary must be temporary must be temporary and introducing taxation at the european level will may uh, may uh, may lead to this resistance i have one question for you still because on the king road on uh, on twitter 
um, making crowns conditional on rule of law and structural economic reforms. If we drop emphasis on loan versus crowns, it could be the opportunity for the Netherlands and the rest of Northern Europe to push for strengthening of the EU's national economies and their democratic political institutions. So what she's hinting at, Louise, and I'm, I'm curious how you see that, could it not be some sort of, I, I do not dare to call it uh, conditionality, right? So that would be the wrong word. I know that from the start, but that the, the uh, sort of assurance that the money is there not uh, not for nothing, that it will lead to changes, uh, both in the, like you said, yes, we need reform. You have the insider outsider problem in the Italian and the Spanish labor market. Is it inconceivable that we, uh, that from the sound in Europe, there will be some form of uh, well economic program? I would I would support the commitment uh, reform commitment from Southern Europe. I think that that uh, macro conditionality con concerning drops in deficits and repayment schedules of debt is problematic because we don't know how long the recovery will take, etc. But conditionality that has to do with uh, conditionality or or indeed. Uh, promises that have to do with undertaking reforms, not reversing reforms. Sanchez is, is offering uh, in Parliament today to reverse some important reforms of the labor market. I think that's, that, that is necessary to make sure that these countries can grow in the future, to not, to not reverse reforms and to undertake future reforms. I would agree with you. Okay. Jakob, how do you see the, you, you saw the reactions to the, the German friends proposal. What stood out for me was the reaction by Sebastian Kurz saying, no, no, we're, we're going to stick to loans. Um, so he was pretty outspoken, I thought. Um, how do you see the situation? Uh, what will help to bring the countries, the member states together? Do you see? Where do you see the options that still, uh, uh, that, are, that are still, that still could still bring the member states together? Is this part of the usual negotiation game or is it, uh, are the problems more intrinsic? What I uh, enjoyed um, so much about uh, my time at the European Parliament is that um, normally um, it's not possible to, you know, convince people to go along with what you want by pressuring them. And that's not the spirit. Um, it's actually um, about convincing them in the spirit of enlightenment, um, uh, sort of, uh, um, and um, and that's a pleasure to to interact in such a way. And and my hope would be um, that the way in which we think about uh, hopefully finding a good answer to to the historic challenge with, with which we're confronted is that this would be done in the same spirit. And I think it's 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 perfectly all right. You know, you go into a discussion, you go into an exchange of views with different perspectives, and then hopefully. Um, uh, after having weighed uh, the different arguments, um, and then um, uh, uh, the process of enlightenment and can bring some sort of a consensus. Uh, and, um, and, and that's what I'm hoping. Uh, um, unfortunately, <laughs> these processes take time. They do take time at the European Parliament. <laughs> and, and they take even more time sometimes because uh, um, uh, they are often uh, this, uh, decisions truly have to be taken in consensus um, at the level of the council. So, but um, uh, but we have a little bit of time. I think uh, um, uh, not too much uh, time okay. is pressing, but we have a little bit of time, and hopefully uh, that time will be used wisely, um, so that afterwards a solution is found. Um, and even you know, half a year down the road, nobody feels, and nobody has to feel in Europe, and that they were being shortchanged or bullied or pressured, but that indeed this was a, a perfectly reasonable, balanced, and, and timely response to the to the challenge that we were confronted with. So I think, and I think that's the only spirit in in which we can succeed. But I can I can see, <laughs> and I. Uh, and uh, I, I, I took a key, keen interest as a member of the European Parliament, also in domestic politics, and I can see why, um, uh, Paul, you asked the question. But I'm afraid, in this uh, on, on this particular occasion, we, we we won't do ourselves a favor. I'm not against political fights, um, 
But I think in this particular case, we don't do as, ourselves a favor if we treat this as a normal political problem. These are exceptional sure. times that require exceptional solutions, both in substance and, and in terms of how one deals with one's differences. And Jakob, uh, you bring in, I understand your answer, and let's hope indeed it's uh, a frank, open exchange that would be wonderful, uh, that when no one feel pressure and everyone uh, reaches out to, uh, to come to a compromise. Uh, but time is, well, in a sense, limited, because if we want to have this recovery initiative in place, it should be, it should be uh, sooner and not later. So is it fair to say that we should have a deal before the summer, so to say, that would even that we in June we see the negotiations in the council? Um, is that also how you see the process in time? Because uh, and doesn't doesn't that give pressure on the on the, uh, on the negotiations? Uh, um, time is pressing, um, uh, and not uh, having a European answer is not an option. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, I think we need to, uh, you know, have a true answer um, to the question of the recovery fund um, as 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 soon as possible. Um, uh, but um, in, uh, of course, the recovery fund is not the only answer that Europe has so far uh, managed to put forward and to enact in response to the crisis. So uh, this is not a matter of, uh, you know, whether it's decided one week earlier or one week later. I think that would be uh, an inaccurate portrayal of the situation we're in. Uh, and there's a curious discussion. I mean, I think I, I, I get the impression our video conversation is, is, is working quite well. Um, um, but uh, um, uh, sometimes it can make a difference whether whether people are able to Sure. Meet personally, um, or whether they're just sort of they, they try to do an all-night video conference. Uh, ministers of Finance, as you know, tried that, um, and, uh, um, and, and 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 it's not necessarily the most uh, effective format to try and uh, find uh, find a consensus. So, so we, we'll have to see. I mean, hopefully, um, uh, um, at some point, uh, um, uh, in, in in European gov governments can can physically come together again, and, and, and perhaps that will expedite the process. Okay. Yeah, we go towards the end of the webinar, is it? So uh, we are cut officially four oh. minutes, but we started four minutes later. But So please, did I raise... I wanted to ask uh, one question of Jacob. Uh, no, no, please, please, please do go ahead. But I just want to say, if we have questions that I should have asked, but didn't ask, this is the moment to bring it forward. So Louise, please go ahead. Jacob, because of your unusual situation, having been an MEP like Paul and me, and now being on the government side, um, I, I wonder if you have a, a sense, and I, I don't, I don't myself, of what will be exactly the role of the of the Parliament in this recovery plan, in the sense that uh, is this just externally assigned revenue, in which case the Parliament just sees it in the procedure of discharge, and we're not really really involved, even though it's European Union budget, like it was in the EFSM, or is this actually money that is part of the budget. I mean, to what extent do you see the parliament being really involved? Uh, what's your sense? I mean, maybe this is too early to tell. I mean, I think it is too early to tell. I think um, from from a sort of perspective of the institution of parliament, um, uh, that the, 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 at least the proposal, uh, let's see what the commission says, but the proposal yes, yes, is within the framework um, of um, the European budget. Um, that's of course uh, already a good thing um, from the perspective of, of the European Parliament. Um, but uh, as you alluded to, the devil is in the details, and um, I don't know the details. Um, I'm afraid we'll have to wait um, until the 27th of May and then make an assessment. Um, in, in in all respects, uh, um, this is an important uh, aspect, uh, going to be an important aspect of the of the proposal. But of course. It's not going to be the only aspect under which uh, the pro proposal should be uh, should be uh, uh, reviewed. Okay, Jakob, is there still a question we should address in this panel that we should? I think we covered a lot of ground uh, on the size of the initiative, the impulse, uh, how it should be spent, how it should be financed, what it brings to the European. Um, uh, uh, cooperation, the Hamiltonian moment. 
Is there a question we should have uh, asked? Do you want to ask a question to me as for Luis and, uh, and, uh, and me as members of European Parliament? Some advice as an, uh, could also be welcome. How do you see that? Yeah, anyway. Well, I think what what is a very important question is um, uh, when when such a proposal is designed um, by so many different countries, so many different perspectives. Um, some people look at it a, a little bit like a Christmas tree. You know, you hang your little um, um, additional decoration um, onto it, uh, and then hope <laughs> you hope it can stay there. Um, and and my my question to you is. How do we manage to sort of <laughs> um, to to make certain um, that uh, um, uh, with uh, all the perfectly legitimate uh, um, specific uh, objectives that uh, different parts of the population and different uh, groups have in Europe, um, uh, that we um, uh, manage to some extent at least to prioritize and say, you know, these are the core issues that this. Um, a recovery fund needs to answer. These are aspects that would be really very useful. Louis, for example, uh, alluded. Um, I, th I think if we can make progress on the revenue side, that would be extremely useful. And uh, Olaf Scholz, in his interview, by the way, yesterday, um, uh, alluded to that as well. So, so they're, they're very, very useful aspects. But maybe, you know, if, if the progress isn't perfect, um, it could still work and it would still be extremely useful. And then maybe there are other aspects that are more peripheral, that um, uh, uh, um, uh, are important, but not necessarily part of a, a recovery fund. So my question would be, how do we manage to, to some extent, discipline ourselves, each and every one in their position, to make this a workable enterprise, in, you know, not to, not to fall into the trap of the Christmas tree logic? So that would be my question. Uh, uh, to both yeah. of you. Luis, please. I, I would go back to my first question, Jacob. I think like a father who's trying to educate their kids and has to have a credible threat, even though he doesn't ever want to execute it, like you will not have a weekend. Uh, me, who is totally against it in a governmental solution, who loves that you go into the community method, I would say there has to be a credible threat that Germany says if by the 30th of, uh, of uh, June uh, we don't have a council agreement, uh, we are going to have the coalition of the willing and the countries that want to continue on this path will join. And I think many countries will, will not want to be left out in the cold and I think you will get the deal. If everybody realizes they have veto power, uh, we are going to be with a very, very major Rockefeller Center sized uh, Christmas tree. I'm afraid. Yeah, okay. That's a good question, Jacob. I'm not sure I have the, uh, the complete answer here, but I would I would suggest that we need a, a phased approach. First, start with the broad principles, like has been outlined in uh, the German French proposals, and then we need a discussion on how, how is it spent. For example, which regions are the most uh, are the uh, are the most hit, and how to reach them. Uh, to have a separate discussion on on own resources, and this all takes time. So I think we can uh, try to um, uh, to make the problems a bit uh, more, uh, let's say, of appropriate size by making by introducing faces in uh, in the. In, in the process because indeed if you want to have this decision all at once and including all the all parts of the christmas tree it's going to be uh, it's going to be uh, a long night so to say in, uh, in the european council <laughs> that's that's for sure uh, but i'm not sure that this is the good answer maybe there are other ways out um i think we're past our time so i would like to thank you very much uh luis thank you much for joining us uh, and jacob uh, also thank you very much for joining us and for overcoming the technical hurdles and and it was, uh, that you uh, that, that you had to fight to come into this uh in the, in the session it was, and it was, it was a lot of fun my my only was regret cool. was that jacob is no longer with us yeah no. that's a, that's a pity but it's, it's really good to see you and i hope to see I you in your life <laughs> Thank you very much. And to all the viewers, um, next week we won't have a webinar, but we will continue. Please send in your ideas for the webinar um, uh, and also look at uh, the questions that haven't been answered. We try to address 
also uh, at, at the website, uh, look at paultang.nl slash webinars, and then you find the QA, the, the questions that have been addressed, uh, that have been put forward, but we couldn't address in this uh, in this webinar. We do our best to answer them, and uh, stay tuned, uh, but also by subscribing to our newsletter. Thank you very much for uh, for joining us, and again, final thank you, Louise. Thank you, Jacob. Much appreciated. Thank you, Paul. Very good to see you. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Luis. Was good. Thank you.